Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be looking at the two witnesses spoken about in chapter 11 of Revelation. Let's get into it. So, who are these two witnesses? We also have the imagery of olive trees and lampstands in verse 3 through 4. A similar passage exists in Zechariah chapter 4. We know that the oil represents the Holy Spirit from 1 Samuel 16, 12 to 13 and other passages where the high priests and kings were anointed with oil. In Zechariah 4, 14, we are told that the two olive trees have branches which represent Zerubbabel, the king, and Joshua, the high priest. In chapter 1, we are told that the seven lampstands are seven churches. The descriptions that follow in Revelation 11, 6 are obviously Elijah, no rain for three and a half years, and Moses, the plagues. At this point, I'll offer some possible explanations for these symbols. The first explanation on the table is that these symbols represent John the Baptist and Jesus. Jesus said that John was Elijah who was to come, Matthew 11, 7 to 14. And an angel foretold that John the Baptist would come in the spirit of Elijah in Luke 1, 11 to 17. Both John the Baptist and Elijah took a stand against religious hypocrisy and called the people to repentance. 1 Kings 18, 16-40, Matthew 3, verse 1-20. to As for Jesus, Moses uh, prophesied about God sending a prophet like him. Deuteronomy 18, 15 and 18-19. And Peter said that Jesus was the fulfilment of that in Acts 3, 22-23. Both Jesus and Moses were born in times that saw all of the boys near their ages and their respective areas murdered. Exodus 1, 22, Matthew 2, 16-18. Both boys had also been hidden from the ruler of the time. Exodus 2, 1-10, Matthew 2, 1-23. And it's, uh, it's worth noting here that also the exodus, 40 years, Jesus' crucifixion to the destruction of the temple, 40 years. Lastly, both John the Baptist and Jesus were martyred. And obviously Jesus rose from the dead after three and a half days. The second explanation is that these symbols represent powerful leaders of the church at the time, perhaps Paul and Peter, and they were both martyred under Nero's reign. This conclusion comes from the fact that Elijah and Moses were powerful spiritual leaders in the Old Testament, and since we already have the similarity to Zechariah chapter 4, it's worth mentioning again that Zerubbabel and Joshua were the, the powerful uh, spiritual leaders at their time. So as uh, you can see it's conceivable that these symbols represent two powerful leaders of the church at the time. The third explanation might be the most resonant. Now I don't think it's a question of and or. I, it's not necessarily a question of one or the other because these ideas really do synthesize together. We have our Moses and Elijah picture there and these are archetypical characters as we know Jesus is Moses, John the Baptist is Elijah and that spirit of just what they represent, what's going on, it flows through this whole narrative. So as we look at the third explanation, let's keep that in mind. So, in chapter 1 we're told that the lampstands represent the churches. Zechariah chapter 4 also mentions two olive branches, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Christians know that Jesus is the vine and we as his followers as the branches, we're the branches, John 15, 1-8. I believe that the specific trees mentioned here in Revelation, in chapter 11, are the Jews and the Gentiles now making up the church or the kingdom of God, Ephesians 2, 1-17. Whoever the two witnesses are, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We know the church has always been built up by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 2, 18-22, Ephesians 4, 1-13. We also know that Christians are a royal priesthood who reign with Christ, 
First Peter 2 9, Revelation 1 6, 5 10, 26. I believe that the other two explanations could still be encompassed in all this, okay? They could be encompassed in this third explanation since both are included in the church and the kingdom. Uh, so at this point, I want to take a wee minute to say I get accused of, of spiritualizing, right? As if that's some kind of criminal charge to be made. See these people that say preterism involves spiritualizing too much? Doesn't it qualify, man? It doesn't qualify at all. I had someone self-refute themselves uh, because I highlighted the fact that Jesus said that uh, John is Elijah who was to come. That is a very spiritual thing. You can't take it at face value unless you want to get into all that. It's a rabbit hole we're not going to go down. I think we need to be very conscious of the spirit. If I turn around to such a person and say, point to God, point to him. Where is God? They wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't know what to do. They would end up spiritualizing God and I say, oh well, in that case he doesn't exist. You're spiritualizing things. You're spiritualizing things and that's bad. Like that's some kind of offense. And I don't get that at all. That is insanity to me that I'm spiritualizing. God is spirit, and the true worshippers will worship God in what? In spirit and in truth. Okay? These are spiritual matters. My goodness, when Jesus says the kingdom doesn't come with observation, you know? Um, and everything here that I'm saying is thematically linked. It's all very well married together. And you know that, you can feel it. You get the message that's coming across here. Um... As we continue to read, we see that Satan is victorious for a time over the two witnesses, three and a half days. And the imagery here is similar to what we see in Daniel, uh, when he has his dream in Daniel 7, verses 21 to 22. And this is probably referring to the persecution that the Christians suffered under Nero, that we discussed about in the previous videos. So these two witnesses are rescued from their persecution, while their enemies are left fearful pondering their own fate. Chapter 11 ends with the seventh trumpet sounding and the dead being judged. The proclamation is made that Jesus now reigns supreme. This reminds me of Matthew 28, 18, where Jesus states that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Jesus has established a new kingdom, the church, and we will reign in this kingdom forever and ever. Christ reigns in this forever and ever, as it says in Isaiah. There is no end to this New Testament. There is no end to it. There is no conclusion. Okay? This New Covenant continues. We are the authors. We continue to write with our lives. And I want to highlight, I want to be a highlighter in that story. Just going over the victory so that we can take it to heart and live in it. That chapter ends with praise being given to the Son and to the Father. Hallelujah. Now the time of judgment and wrath is coming upon the people of Israel. Matthew 23, 35-38 There has been a changing of the guard. The church is now the one and only true kingdom of God. Even the Ark of the Covenant is no longer in Israel but is within the new temple of God in heaven. The church is the new temple. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Ephesians 2.21 We are the living stones with the indwelling spirit 